expected for quite a long time. It's amazing that um, there haven't been more attacks in London, really. It shows that the services must be doing a good job. It's a bad way of saying it, but because these attacks happen almost so often, you kind of don't harden yourself to it, but it's just one of these that you're almost expecting it now, aren't you, in these days? I've been quite shaky because we're quite close, just over the river there, but uh, it was bound to happen at some stage, I feel. My grandparents, you know, remember the war and talk about the war. And there's a kind of stoicism. I mean, maybe it's sad that we almost expect this to happen. I'm feeling OK. I think, you know, you're, you're going to be in danger wherever you go. Many of the tourists I've seen, some from uh, South Korea, some from Spain, uh, surprisingly indicated that they weren't uh, frightened by the events. Uh, they were obviously uh, saddened, but uh, a sense that they had become uh, used to this sort of thing now. It is something at the back of my mind, yeah, it's, it's got to be, isn't it? You know, I'm working up here, I'm weather there, it'll happen again. But fingers, no one, eh? But uh, you don't know, you don't know. But life's got to go on, and life has got to go on. Sort of get used to it a little bit around here, you know, there's always things happening. But uh, it wasn't lovely, you know, it was just right outside our window and it was, it was quite horrible. Always on our minds that this could happen, and it's uh, happened across Europe, and uh, here it is happening in London, uh, outside Parliament. Do you think about not coming? Oh, definitely not. No, no. No, nothing was going to stop us coming. Doesn't matter where you are, if your number's up, your number's up, so... Business as usual. Business yeah. as usual. Nothing's going to put you off being no. in London today. No, We've always known that it's going to be coming, but, um, you know, let's just carry on as normal. This life has to go on. And life is going on. Although perhaps today, people are holding on to those they love a little more tightly. I mean, it's, it's terrible. People, people have died. It's, it's horrific. Um, but I mean, I've lived in London for six years, and you don't, you sort of don't really think about it. You sort of become, you know, sort of expect it on a daily basis. Actually, I think probably I'm almost expecting that it will happen sooner or later in London. Anyway. Do you feel safe here at the event today? I'm probably as safe as I've felt before, as I said. London will be a target for terrorists because it, it, it just gets very, it's a good highlight for them to get a terrorist attack in London. So um, I'm, I trust the London police and I trust um, England that it's not, it's going to, it's not going to, who knows how many previous times they stopped it, we don't actually know about it. Three hours after the attack, people headed to the stations for the journey home. A routine slightly nervously maintained. I think it's a bit um, anxious, yes. I'm surprised by the lack of yeah. security <laughs> around this general area, but um, otherwise it seems to have settled down a little bit, but it's a nervous attitude. Many we met were on holiday, some from parts of the world where these kinds of horrors happen all too frequently. We are from Israel, and we are pretty uh, regular or used for uh, terror attacks, yeah. so it's it's sad, but it's it's sad, but we live it every day. The children's thoughts, including 14-year-old Esteban, are with the three French students who were hurt yesterday. Uh, I'm feeling bad. I'm feeling bad for the victim, and uh, I'm scared. Uh, I'm scared. How safe do you feel? Well, you don't feel safe. Um, with what's been going on the last month or so, it's been quite tough for us all. Um, I mean, absolutely horrified. I mean, I just live around the corner here, and uh, it was all unexpected in a way, but I suppose we've all been told to expect these things, so... Uh... You can't do anything about it. You've just got to go out and, and get on and keep going. Got to carry, on. carry on. Oh, absolutely, oh, yeah. yeah. You can't let them beat us. We're old enough to... <laughs> yes. <laughs> We were in the war, <laughs> nearly. The main purpose of the flowers is to remember my friend, who uh, is luckily alive. We've had our turn before. I think we'll have it again. Um, it's our turn this time. This time, I think it'll be, uh, there'll be more of it. It's that kind of world we live in. No one really expected this to happen. You've never been told for ages. been told for ages that it would. I don't know if I can feel relief yet. I'm still sad. Still walking across here. It's, it's just uh, quite hard, actually. I didn't realise it would be. Uh, Max 
expect this thing to happen to you. So when it does, you get this incredible feeling of, of vulnerability and and fear. To see the images afterwards of everybody laying prone on the on the pavement it was awful, absolutely dreadful. People are obviously going to finish work around five, half five, six o'clock. So the crowds will build up. I can see now at the moment, um, Gav, that they're lighting uh, candles over here. Um, so it's we're trying it through the crowds. It's we're trying it through the crowds. So it's, it's picking up uh, because it was obviously only announced today. Um, and we had up the top murals and people with chalk and now we see that there's um, sand and people lighting candles and that's here at the left hand side of Trevally Square but it's also at the right hand side and we expect more in the next 10 or 15 minutes and it is a case of people finding out about this on social media on the news and then coming to the square to pay respects to the victims so people have come here to pay their respects to remember the victims of yesterday's terror attack and we had uh, four people died tragically and 40 people have been injured in this ter terrorist attack. Uh, what's the mood where you are? Well, indeed, yes, there were three key speakers. There were Sadiq Khan, who is the Mayor of London, Amber Rudd, who is the Home Secretary, and also the Acting Police Commissioner, Craig Mackey. And they all spoke on similar themes, really, speaking of the need to overcome hatred to come together. Uh, Sadiq Khan, the London Mayor, saying that Londoners will not be cowed by incidents like this. However, the uh, vigil here, the uh, candle lighting ceremony and the various speeches by those three uh, key dignitaries hasn't been massively well attended. I would say that in total, excluding the very many journalists who are here, there are perhaps a thousand people gathered. Ladies and gentlemen, Craig Mackey, the Acting Metropolitan Police Commissioner. Thank you for coming here tonight to show the true nature of our city. Yesterday's events were truly terrible. Three people were taken from us. Many more were gravely injured and all of us have been deeply affected by what has happened and all of us have been deeply affected by what has happened. Ladies and gentlemen, the Home Secretary, the Right Honourable Amber Rudd MP. I'd like to start by saying thank you and paying tribute to the officer that lost his life, Keith Palmer. I know we will all be thinking about his friends and his family. He was courageous, he was brave, and he was also doing his duty. And he is not alone in doing that. I know that all officers of the Met are like that. I know that all officers of the Met are like that. In my experience, so are all policemen. In my experience, so are all policemen. And I want us to say thank you to them all. And I want us to say thank you to them all. for their great sacrifice and risks that they take to keep us safe. They and the emergency services. It reminded us all how we are all so connected. It reminded us all how we are all so connected. At its height, over 40 appliances 
and over 250 firefighters were tackling what was a significant and serious fire. It reminded us all how we are all so connected, particularly when the random victims on the bridge of different nationalities, tourists going about their business, were also mowed down in a terrible way. Were also mowed down in a terrible way. But they will not win. We are all connected. And today we showed that by coming together, by going to work, by going to work. Going to work. Going to work. Going, going to work. Going to work. Our normal business, our normal business, because the terrorists will not defeat us. We will defeat them. We are strong in our values and proud of our country. This is our land. A land of peace and of plenty. A land of harmony and hope. This is our land. Ladies and gentlemen, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. We come together as Londoners tonight to remember those who have lost their lives and all those affected by the horrific attack yesterday, but also to send a clear message. Londoners will never be cowed by terrorism. Those evil and twisted individuals who try to destroy our shared way of life will never succeed and we condemn them. And this is a time to express our gratitude to the heroism of our police officers and emergency services who ran towards danger. And when Londoners face adversity, we always pull together. Our response to this attack on our city, to this attack on our way of life, to this attack on our shared values shows the world what it means to be a Londoner. Terrorism has touched both my family in the Middle East and it's touching me here where I live and I think people don't realise that Muslims are scared twice over if not just one time and it's just ridiculous, it's so ridiculous and it's just ridiculous so ridiculous felt it was pretty bad Ran out, ran out of pain. Um, did go to art school, but still ran out of pain.
Mind Control, the secret UK government blueprints shaping post-terror planning. After the 2017 London Bridge attack, local officials were told, we're sending you a hundred imams. Our hashtags, vigils and flowers are used to steer the public toward grief instead of anger. British government has prepared for terrorist incidents by pre-planning social media campaigns that are designed to appear to be a spontaneous public response to attacks. Hashtags are carefully tested before attacks happen. Instagram images selected and impromptu street posters are printed. In operations that contingency planners term controlled spontaneity, politicians, statements, vigils and interfaith events are also negotiated and planned in readiness for any terrorist attack. The campaigns have been deployed during every terrorist incident in recent years, including 2017 London Bridge attack and the Finsbury Park mosque attack. Within hours of an attack, other campaigns are swiftly organised with I Heart posters being designed and distributed according to the location of the attack. The plans drawn up for the people to hand out flowers at the scene of the crime in apparently unprompted gestures of love and support. Solidarity, humanity and a deep concern for lives lost. So much has changed for Londoners and yet seeing its resilience again today, it's clear so much remains the same. The purpose of the operations, according to a number of people involved in their creation, is to shape public responses, encouraging individuals to focus on empathy for the victims and a sense of unity with strangers, rather than reacting with violence or anger. Many of the operations are said to be modelled on extensive plans that were drawn up in the UK to channel anger in the wake of any attack on the 2012 London Olympics. The measures drawn up in advance of the Olympics were intended to corral the Princess Diana's grief that was expected to emerge after any mass casualty attack a reference to the public mourning that followed the death of Princess Diana in a car crash in 1997. This person describes those measures candidly as an attempt at mind control. The management of the secret hidden emergency planning work behind the Olympics became the social control that we would fall back on if we had any terrorist attack or if we had any disruption. It's this is the hashtag we go to and we've never come back from those days. This job has changed significantly from planning for organic people responses to tragedy to being told we would like the people to do that. How do we get them there? A lot of the public's responses are spontaneous, of course, but a lot are shaped. The government doesn't want spontaneity, it wants controlled spontaneity. As long as we're together, the fear that these people are trying to cause can never come across. Officials at the Home Office in particular are said to have been impressed by football fans' demonstration of support for a Premier League player, Fabrice Momba, after he suffered a cardiac arrest and collapsed on the pitch in March 2012, four months before the start of the Olympics. At subsequent matches, fans of many different clubs held up placards and banners bearing messages of support for Momba. Middle East Eye understands that during subsequent contingency planning meetings, home officials suggested that replicating such a response could assist the recovery process after any terrorist attack and result in the Olympic Games continuing. When CNN tried to pass off a demonstration in London as a spontaneous event that their cameras happened upon, it was a citizen journalist who captured the behind-the-scenes footage showing that the protest was a carefully stage-managed event including the reporter and crew telling people where and how to line up for maximum effect. Hear that people are celebrating such a wonderful life event as their anniversary and to be lost. Where our hearts go out to them, and we really feel badly. Kirk Cochran was in London to celebrate his 25th wedding anniversary. His wife is injured but survived. His death was announced today. One man carrying a picture of Kirk Cochran and the other victims on his back. Yeah, I'd like to pass on my condolences to the family. You know, I'm very sorry for what this guy did to, to their family and uh, the torment and anguish that they're feeling right now. Patrick Johnson is just one of several with messages for the Cochrane family, who tonight are in London as Kirk's wife, Melissa, continues to recover. This is one of the great selfie spots in the whole of London. There's a group of people here, amongst them, a young Romanian architect. It's a woman called Andrea Cristia. 
She's with her bloke in London. It's his birthday. That's real. Yeah. Yesterday, quarter to three, it was deadly silent, and that was really peculiar. That was eerie. That was it was quite surreal, and it was like there was little vignettes of, of, of individual little, little uh, events going on. It didn't seem to be any coherency. It's only today that I've seen the news. I've listened to the radio and I understand that what I was walking past wasn't casualties, or what wasn't living casualties. It were actually, people who had been killed. It must have been a massive shock to find out. Yes. Yes. I was in shock when I found out that I was in shock when I found out that the guy living next to me murdered innocent people. It must have been a massive shock to find out. Yes. Yes. I was in shock. It, this will be a shock for everybody involved. It was shocking. Looked around me in, in shock. It was just, um, you know, complete shock. So that was quite shocking. Bystanders too shocked. And people came off the bus looking very shocked. Surrounded by shocked bystanders. An extreme shock. Um, well, I, look, I looked into it and I, I, I was shocked. The mood here, Ali, is one of shock. No, I think more people were just in shock. And it was all, yeah, real shock. And you must have been shocked. Very shocked. Very shocked. The deadly attack hitting close to home, shocking travellers. It was a shock. It's quite a sense of shock. I, I think most people are very shocked. Shocking in any city. But it's still shocking. But I was very, very shocked. Shocking and uh, I think that's a bit of shock. We saw two ladies crying, they were running back this way, they were shocked about the incident that happened. You just have a complete sense of shock. I'm in shock. And indeed, that was the shocking scene that we saw in London this afternoon. It's just shocking, just shocking. Yesterday's attack was shocking. So I was actually really shocked. Uh, he'd only been there 10 months. Um, and that in itself is shocking. I can't really, do you know what I was, was a bit, just in shock, shock, to be honest. Yeah. Fluorescent flashes and wailing sirens remind those who were in London in 2005 of the aftermath of 7-7, extra police patrols, some with guns. The band goes round twice. Everybody needs to go about their lives as they normally would. Our society should continue to function in accordance with our values. If today's attack was born of a terrorist ideology which makes targets of ordinary people, targets of ordinary people, then tonight there is a response, a way of life which bustles on, barely interrupted. I don't think it's a time to be scared right now. I think it's a time to band together as, as people and not change anything that we're doing and not let terror take control of our lives. Yeah, I was here on Wednesday morning, here today. Uh, yes, it's, yeah, it, to me, you've got to be normal. Do the same as you always do. Don't, don't be afraid of it, anything, so. If you can't go out and, enjoy, and carry on enjoying your life, then they've won. So that's how I feel about it. Basically, I'm an expat Londoner. I grew up in Battersea. I live in Kent now. Today's a long planned visit, and I don't see why the hell the bugger should put me off. So I'm going to get on with my life and do what I want to do. We've just been to changing of the guards, and there was loads of people there. And um, that's what London thrives on, people coming out. And if we close the streets, then they've won, haven't they? They've got what they wanted, which is to stop people going out and, and enjoying their lives. And there's a mixture of anger and sadness, but also courage and defiance. They have to get back to work. They have to carry on with their ordinary lives. It's a strange mixture of emotion, and one I suppose we'll have to start getting used to. We'll have to start getting used to. It just makes me more determined that these awful people aren't gonna get away with it. Why should we stop our living our lives the way we do for these nutters? I think everyone just carries on as normal because that's all you can do, isn't it, really? 
Um, and is it important for you to, to just carry on? Well, yes, because otherwise you just let everyone win all the time, don't you? If you give in, then they win. So you're not going to change anything in the light of what happened yesterday? No, no. There's no need to. We should just go on with our lives, as I think Theresa May said, you know, if anyone select us from what we think is right and the path that we want to go on. As the appalling events in Paris were unfolding, this House was debating the Government's counter-terrorism and security bill and the threat level in the United Kingdom, which is set by the Independent Joint Terrorism Analysis Centre and remains at severe. This means that a terrorist attack in our country is highly likely and could occur without warning. Uh, so, I also said that the matrix system of threat assessment and my first degree is statistics, was a, a ludicrous attempt by the government, National Police Improvement Agency, to almost mind control and dumb down thinking, intelli criminal intelligence analysis thinking, on looking at threat. Why would they do that? Well, the construct that they had within the matrix was artificial and deliberately heightened the fear coming from uh, Islamic extremism and the terror attack. So JTAC, Joint Terrorist Analysis Centre, always put out the threat levels as, as almost imminent, high or severe. Now, in a crude scoring system, that had to be transferred locally, irrespective of what intelligence you had locally. And, the, the, and the, potentially the harm a terrorist act could do, well, it's how far will the imagination stretch? I suspect the government will be taking advice from uh, the government's security advisers who uh, give independent advice about the security situation. They talk to the police and the security services. They then decide what the government, or what they advise the government to do, and then the Prime Minister uh, and the Home Secretary decide whether then to increase the threat level. And the threat level in the United Kingdom 
which is set by the Independent Joint Terrorism Analysis Centre. And then the Prime Minister uh, and the Home Secretary decide whether then to increase the threat level. I'm joined by Security Analyst and Executive Director of the Henry Jackson Society, Dr Alan Mendoza. Good morning to you, Dr Mendoza. Um, you've carried out analysis of information that came out after the attack in Westminster. Talk us through your findings. Well, I think it's, it's, it's broader than that. What you're looking at is in Western countries in the past few years, you're looking at the types of attack that have occurred. Um, and what we found is that in 2016, whereas vehicular attacks, you know, attacks using a vehicle to kill uh, civilians, were at around 7.6%, they have uh, they rose dramatically uh, the year after, 2017, to about 20.4% of all attacks in Western countries. Now, that's a huge huge increase, obviously, and, and I think reflects the ease of um, ability of getting hold of a, a vehicle as a method of attack as opposed to some of the more sophisticated things we've seen in the past. Yeah, it does seem that those who want to carry out these kind of attacks are going for the low-tech options. It's a low-tech option, it's the easy-to-access option, it's also the very difficult-to-stop option because at the end of the day you can just have somebody, it, it would appear, who can just get up one morning, go and stake out something and then attack rather than having to plan a whole bombing uh, campaign. It's interesting, isn't it? The Houses of Parliament, one of the most protected sites in the world, um, they're set up for this kind of thing. You can see the barriers there and police on the scene within minutes. There is now a debate about pedestrianising roads in front of Parliament and at other high-profile sites in the country, those that may be the target for terror. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's summed up by one of the, uh, the news headlines you just showed a moment ago. We can't let them win. If we allow our cities to be pedestrianised, if we allow them to dictate the way that our cities are, are, are used, then haven't terrorists won in that way? So obviously a democratic institution like Parliament goes to the heart of what this country is about. Um, and that is why, obviously, uh, it's always going to be a target. Um, at the same time, you'll note about the preparedness that, that that is key here. It is really true that were this to have happened somewhere else, the police would probably not have been there in, in the same amount of time, simply because they're not ready for it. So there is this very dangerous game you've got to play between. Do, in a sense, you, you recognise there will be high-profile targets and then you prepare for that and you respond really quickly. Or you try and displace that activity somewhere else and it could be much, much worse. I think it's worth seeing in some of the other cases uh, we've seen on the continent with, with guns and things, that the more minutes it takes to get to the, the scene of the crime, the more people who die. Despite increases in the number of murders committed by terrorists in recent years, especially a series of horrible attacks in 2017 that murdered 42 people, the long-run trend is a decline in the number of people murdered by terrorists in the United Kingdom. From 1975 through to August 15th, 2018, a British person's chance of being murdered in a terrorist attack on British soil was about 1 in 1.1 million per year. But that annual chance of being murdered in a terrorist attack obscures big shifts over time. Over the last decade, the annual chance of being murdered in a terrorist attack on British soil was about 1 in 11.4 million per year, far lower than the entire 1975 to 2018 period. The annual chance of being injured over the entire time was 1 in 496,464 per year, but only 1 in 1.4 million per year over the decade. Figure 3 means that the chance of a British person being murdered in a terrorist attack was 1 in 63,280,444 that year. In 2016, 
2017 and 2018 so far, the annual chance of being murdered in a terrorist attack was about 1 in 7.3 million per year, 1 in 1.8 million per year, and 0 so far respectively. These above figures show that the chance of dying or being injured in a terrorist attack in the United Kingdom is small, yet terrorism succeeds in terrifying people. The odds of dying from accidental injuries, drug poisoning is the leading cause of injury death in the United States. The lifetime chances of dying from accidental drug poisoning were 1 in 68 in 2017, compared with 1 in 572 in a car accident, and 1 in 218,106 for fatal injuries caused by lightning. As you can see, the chances of dying from a terrorist attack is approximately 5 times less likely than being struck by lightning. How many of us are scared of being struck by lightning on a daily basis? Think about being struck by lightning every day it could happen it's going to happen no one i would imagine we we have had a remarkably small number of terrorist attacks uh, but unfortunately that's not going to stay that way we are going to have more and it's something that we as a society need to understand the biggest threat right now is homegrown terrorists uh, british born citizens who are strongly influenced by what they see and what they read on the internet on the bbc regularly we hear uh, yeah. kind of uh, attempts at trying to say we need a fortress Britain and it's the fault of refugees. Well, the fortress Britain uh, hasn't paid off. What can you do about somebody who, who decides to blow themselves up? Uh, there's almost no defence to that. I think that we need to take necessary precautions to make sure that we protect that which we value. We as a whole country value Permanent anti-terror barriers will be placed on roads surrounding Windsor Castle at a cost of £1.9 million, the Borough Council has said. Temporary barriers designed to prevent vehicle attacks were installed in March after a car was used to run down pedestrians in Westminster. The council said that some of the money would be spent on ensuring the barriers blend into their surroundings. Barriers went up around the Royal Residence in Berkshire on Monday, forming a ring of steel. The force said the changes were proportionate and necessary, but said there was no specific threat to Windsor. Since the emergence of the threat from Islamist-inspired terrorism, our country has made significant progress in disrupting plots and protecting the public. I would like to express my condolences to the family and colleagues of the former Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland, Martin McGuinness. Of course, we do not condone or justify the path he took in the earlier part of his life, and we should never forget that, nor the victims of terrorism. However, as my noble friend Lord Trimble set out yesterday, he played an indispensable role in bringing the Republican movement away from violence to peaceful and democratic means and to building a better Northern Ireland. This city has been here before. Harvey remembers the IRA attacks in the 1970s. His parents experienced even greater carnage. What we have to remember is people do these things for publicity and public reaction. And just like the IRA outrages in the decades gone past, we have to make sure the public reaction is not what they want, but it's not what they want. So, for example, if it turns out that the attacker was Muslim, we shouldn't hate Muslims. We should say to the Muslims, we're very sorry that someone who claims to have your religion has done this kind of thing. In the same way, in the 1960s and 70s, when there were IRA bombs, people said, I hate the Irish. Within two decades, within 20 years, we were saying, we know this is not being done in your name. We sympathise with you. With I these remember back in the days when it was the IRA doing the terrorist attacks and we used to visit London then, and it's, it's just a different people doing it now. And it won't put you off, it won't put me off anyway. If we look to the situation of terrorism 
well, foremost on everyone's mind is, of course, the situation with uh, jihadism. And in the UK, the threat is perhaps as severe as it's been since 2001. And this is because the threat itself is so diverse. You're looking at uh, lone actor plots, uh, highly networked cells. You're looking at really rudimentary attacks with vehicle rammings, knife stabbings, to coordinated <coughs> bombings. So in Ireland, the situation is very different. I don't think the jihadist uh, threat is uh, anywhere near what it is like in, in the UK. It's, it's a very different uh, scenario. But where Ireland does obviously see the issue of terrorism is with paramilitaries. <coughs> And just last month, uh, the British Security Service said that Northern Ireland is probably uh, the most concentrated area of terrorist activity in all of Europe. They said that Northern Ireland is probably uh, the most concentrated area of terrorist activity in all of Europe. And you could see this with a steady drumbeat of uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, uh, so in the last five years, there have been uh, almost 350 shootings, almost 350 shootings relating to Northern Ireland uh, terrorism, as well as over 250 uh, bombing incidents as well. Over 250 uh, bombing incidents as well. And there's also steady seizure of uh, explosives, of firearms, and of course, the number of people arrested. And, it, and it's widely understood that all groups, whether they've actively been involved in decommissioning efforts, maintain access to weapons or arsenal of weapons as well. There's a, another terror. like that happens uh, in your hometown you don't have a feeling of being glad that you're so far away what you feel is that you wish you could be there with loved ones to to stand alongside them this act of terrorism was supposed to divide the people of London I know for a fact that all something like this does is bring them closer together tonight we send our heartfelt thoughts to everybody in Britain. Stay safe. Viewers praised James for addressing the terrorist attack that hit so close to home for him. After word spread about the incident, many celebrities shared their thoughts and prayers on Twitter. Niall Horan tweeted, thinking of London this morning from LA, stay safe everyone. Katy Perry sent her love for the UK via emojis, and singer Hayley Steinfeld shared a similar post, writing, my heart is with you, London. And Jam Chowdhury did nothing to assuage his critics, and everything to antagonize them. This is his vision for the UK. Of course, alcohol will be banned, drugs will be banned, pornography will be banned, gambling will be banned, but the, the money... Queen with the Queen? There will be no monarchy. Queen Elizabeth, go to hell! Queen Elizabeth, go to hell! A reputation as a rabble-rouser. who refused to condemn al-Qaeda's attacks in the US, the UK and beyond when asked on CNN if he'd condemned the killing of American journalists James Foley and Stephen Sotloff in Syria, he refused. Well, quite frankly, I think it's completely pathetic and absurd for you to ask a Muslim to condemn the killing of one individual. A former hard-partying law student, he grew into a hardcore Islamist. Along with his leader, radical cleric Omar Bakri Fostok, he ran the now outlawed Al-Majaroon group. 
that inspired a young British Muslim to detonate a suicide bomb in Mike's place, a pizza parlour in Tel Aviv. Over 100 people who've either been convicted of terrorist-related offences, carried out terrorist-related offences, or tried to carry out violent uh, attacks, who've been connected to him. So we've always said he's, he's a gateway to terror. It's been a gateway to a network which has spread across Europe. Chowdhury is alleged to have set up, in effect, Al Mujahiroon franchises to help similar minds exert their influence on similar groups. His reach extended into Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands. He helped set up Sharia for Belgium, which radicalised those involved in the Paris attacks and many more who headed to Syria. Likewise, in France, Germany, Italy, Portugal and Spain. He also helped launch another Sharia for branch in Indonesia, which has seen as many as 800 jihadis go off to Syria. The one-time lawyer always managed to evade prosecution, often teasing the authorities, but careful not to cross the line. He organised this demonstration outside the Lebanese embassy, brandishing placards with the acronym ISIS clearly visible, but standing for Islamic State is solution. Two months later, ISIS was prescribed and those banners disappeared. Do you support violence mm -hmm. to achieve the goal of a worldwide Ummah? In his countless TV appearances, Chowdhury never condemned the atrocities, the suicide bombs, the beheadings, the mass slaughters. Do you not worry that it is your voice that's helping radicalize people who want to do this? But his constant messages on social media has finally led to his downfall. You deserve to be arrested, prosecuted, jailed for the rest of your life. But it won't be prison for the rest of the cleric's life. His conviction for supporting ISIS carries a maximum 10-year sentence. Chowdhury now reportedly arrested on suspicion of terror-related offences. Few in the UK will mourn his silencing, however short it may be. The spirit of Manchester and the spirit of Britain is far mightier than the sick plots of depraved terrorists. That is why the terrorists will never win and we will prevail.